Welcome to Rodrinomics. In this video, we're going to see the fundamental differences between the two dominating schools of thought in macroeconomics. On the one hand, there are the classical economists, and on the other hand, are the Keynesian economists. Classical economists began with the ideas in 18th century France, which were later developed and made popular by Adam Smith in his treatise of the Wealth of Nations. This group of philosophers and economists believe in the idea that markets are self-correcting and that the role of the government in the economy should be completely or very restrained. This is very much reflected on the microeconomic model of supply and demand. In this model, if the price of one good falls due to an increase in supply, then the market will automatically reach a new equilibrium with higher consumption and output, for example, in the market of oranges. But note that this model is assuming something very important. In order to produce more oranges, the market is necessarily redirecting scarce factors of production from another part of the economy, for example, pears. Similarly, if price of oranges had increased due to an in a reduction in supply, then we will be redirecting resources to produce more pears. Overall, what this assumes is that our economy is always using all its available resources. This can be shown in a production possibility curve diagram such as this one, where the choice is between more oranges versus less pears and vice versa. Another critical element of the classical theory is that this model of supply and demand can be applied to the factor market, for example, the labor market with the only difference that instead of speaking of price of labor, now we talk of wages, and instead of price of capital and land, we talk of interests and rent. Therefore, if we extend our previous example, we could conclude that if wages increase due to a reduction in the supply of labor, then we will reach a new equilibrium in the labor market, but the economy will be producing the same amount of output because in this case, we will substitute labor with other factors of production that become relatively cheaper such as machines, in our production process. This certainly makes sense. If workers become too expensive, we will expect companies to substitute workers for machines. Overall, this establishes that the amount of output in an economy is constant in the long term after all the adjustments have taken place. This representation of the maximum output via the production possibility curve diagram can also be represented as a constant level of real GDP independently of the price of goods, and this is the classical long-run aggregate supply. Note that according to this curve, it does not matter how much we pay for our factors of production and goods and services. Once we have reached the maximum production in the economy, there is no way to increase production unless we add more labor, capital, land or enterprise. Classical economists acknowledge that in the short run the economy can suffer these equilibriums and be below or above the long-term economic potential. And this is why, in addition to the long-run aggregate supply, the classical model requires a short-run aggregate supply curve to explain the short-term fluctuations that eventually converge in the long-term potential level of output. This theory contrasts with Keynesianism macroeconomic theory. Keynes developed his macroeconomic theories after the Great Depression that ensured the 1929 stock market crash. According to classical economists, all markets, including the labor market, should tend to a new equilibrium, therefore there should not be any surplus or unemployment. But Keynes observed during this period the persistence of unemployment in the labor market. In his treatise, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money, he argued that wages in particular display downward rigidity. That is, in a period where wages should fall to adapt the market to a new equilibrium, the wages do not fall, hence the phrase of sticky wages. The idea is that salaries take a lot of time to adapt as they are driven by contracts between employees and employers, and also that workers have alternatives to work, such as leisure, and therefore they may not be willing to accept any hourly rate wage. In a way, we can think of this as being a minimum price on labor, as workers are not willing to accept a price below this level for their hours of work. Because according to Keynes the price of labor does not fall as predicted by classical economists, then it turns out that this factor of production can remain unemployed and, therefore, the economy can be in a situation where it permanently underuses its available resources. 
which in our production possibility curve diagram is shown by the area below the curve. Now let's see what happens in a labor market where there is unemployment due to a very low demand for workers. If demand increases in this situation, wages will not increase because the market is depressed. It turns out that we can increase our output in this economy by employing more workers and our costs of production will not change because we have not yet reached a point above the sticky wage level. This means that we can increase production without changing the price level in the economy, and this can be shown in a diagram by representing a perfectly elastic aggregate supply curve, where real GDP can increase without changing the aggregate price level. Keynes did not completely ditch the classical theory. He still believed that there is a level of maximum potential output in an economy, and this is also represented by the perfectly inelastic aggregate supply. So, in between an economy with unemployment of resources represented by the elastic curve and the economy with fully employed resources represented by the inelastic curve, we need a transition gap. During this gap, as we get closer and closer to the full employment of our resources, it becomes evident that it also becomes harder and harder to find more workers or capital and so we need to increase our payments in order to attract those increasingly scarce resources. Because in the Keynesian theory there is no short-run disequilibrium that gets corrected in the long run by an adaptation of prices, but rather there can be a long-run disequilibrium, there is no need for a separate short-run and a long-run curve. The same aggregate supply describes the economy at all times thanks to its particular shape. A very important conclusion from the Keynesian model is that, since the economy can remain locked in a period of unemployment forever, then the action from the government to stimulate the economy and bring it back to the level of full employment is necessary. This is what happened in the USA after the initial depression, via the implementation of Roosevelt's New Deal, which included large-scale public expenditure projects. We don't know to what extent did Roosevelt get inspired by Keynes, but we do know that Keynes wrote an open letter in 1933 to Roosevelt urging the new president to borrow money to spend in the economy. The full recovery of the American economy occurred during World War II, which also led to a large level of public spending. So, which model is the best one? Who was right? Perhaps both are right. As Keynes suggested, in a recessionary period caused by a fall in aggregate demand, it may be advisable to intervene in the economy, but a recessionary period caused by a shock in supply, such as an increase in the costs of production from an increase in the price of oil, will be difficult to solve through demand-side government intervention. At the same time, both Keynesianism and classical economics acknowledge the importance of supply-side policies to encourage long-term economic growth. Ultimately, as often happens in economics, we don't know who is right and who is wrong. There is no right or wrong, and your political preferences and beliefs may play a large role on which model you prefer. One where the government should not intervene in the economy as the economy auto-regulates itself, or one where the government plays a large role in the economy as it is unable to bring itself back out from an economic recession. Note that in the IB extends you are required to have a solid command of both models. The reason is that none is right or wrong, so you need to be able to critique each of them and defend their pros and cons. Students generally find the Keynesian model easier, as there is no need to conduct the analysis of the short-term versus long-term transition. However, precisely because of this reason, I advise students to depart from the classical model as it gives the possibility to evaluate the long-term consequences and to supplement the debate with the Keynesian model. And this is it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please click on like if you did and subscribe for more.